die Entscheidung im Achter. Schweiz, Ungarn, England, Amerika, Italien und Deutschland. Zum ersten Mal bei den Olympischen Spielen hat sich ein deutscher Achter bis zur Entscheidung durchgekämpft. Italien kommt auf. Deutschland greift an. Well, welcome everyone to How a Book Can Save a Building. I'm Rafe Beck, Executive Director of the University of Oregon Alumni Association. And yes, that was film footage of the actual 1936 Olympic race you were just watching. We have a great crowd gathered virtually tonight and I offer a special welcome to the members of our alumni book club who selected the boys in the boat. If you're not already a member of the book club, I encourage you to join which means you would get to vote on future books. And we will drop a, a link in the chat here. We'll also include a link in the follow-up email after the event. I, I do encourage you to, to check it out. We won't check up if you actually do the reading or not, but we'd love for you to be involved. At the University of Oregon, we begin many of our events with a land acknowledgement statement. And it's my honor to present such a statement at this event. The University of Oregon in Eugene is located within the traditional homelands of the Southern Kalapuya, Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to the Coast Reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon. We also recognize the UO's presence in Portland on the ancestral homelands of the Cowlitz and Clackamas peoples, the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology in Charleston, on the ancestral homelands of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, Sayusla, and Maluk Coos peoples, and the Pine Mountain Observatory in Bend on the ancestral homelands of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. We also want to acknowledge the lands and waters where the University of Washington sits, the topic of our event tonight, the home of the Duwamish, the people of the inside, and all of the Coast Salish people, it is the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands 
within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. We're here today to celebrate a story distinctly of the Pacific Northwest and a facility, the ASU Dub Shell House, as a regional treasure that we all share as members of the Pac-12 or more historically appropriate for the 1930s, the Pacific Coast Conference. We're fortunate to hear from a Duck alumna tonight who is leading efforts to restore the ASU Dub Shell House. And we're honored to be joined later by author Daniel James Brown. But first, it's now my pleasure to hand things off to Clay Eels, our moderator for the evening and a 1974 Duck alumnus. Clay, please take it away. And Clay, would you please unmute yourself? I knew that would be something I'd forget. Anyway, thank you very much, Rafe, and thanks to everybody who uh, who who uh, is here tonight for this online presentation about this exciting book. And uh, I am coming to you from Seattle, Washington. I've been in the Northwest my whole life, and as Rafe said, I graduated from the University of Washington in 1974 with a journalism degree and. Seemingly one way or another, my life has been about uh, ink on paper and uh, of course, more recently uh, online and communications is everything. And, and that includes uh, historic preservation and I'll get into that a little bit later. But it's my honor to uh, introduce right at this point, um, Nicole Klein, who is the Capital Campaign Director for the ASU Dub Shell House it's been my honor to get to know her over the past year. So uh, take it away, Nicole. Thank you, Clay. Um, I'm not actually in the Shell House, but this is my favorite picture to show where I should be, um, non-COVID times, and where I wish you all could be um, feeling the experience of inside this building. Um, so yes, I'm from Coos Bay, Oregon, and grew up there and then came to Seattle around 2005. But before that, I was a duck. I graduated with a BA in art history and political science in 2002, and then stayed around for a graduate degree in museum studies and focused on cultural policy and that sort of thing. So this job brings me great joy because I'm finally getting to use all of my degrees in one space. Um, I wanted to show that I have support for both. So I'm wearing my Husky jacket that keeps me warm and my Oregon jacket underneath to show that I've never lost my pride. And um, I'll make sure to tie in, you know, the reasons why ducks should care about this building along the way. Um, and a special thanks for Clay for moderating and also for um, Dan who is waiting in the wings. So thank you guys. Well, great. Oh. Um, we're going to, we're gonna get started with Nicole, but I wanted to remind everybody right at the outset, um, that the the star of the show the pièce de résistance you, you will meet at the end and that is daniel james brown who wrote the boys in the boat so um hang in there and we'll get to daniel and not only will he be talking but he, he will be able to answer some of your questions that you submit along the way so nicole can you uh just get us started here with telling us about the history of the shell house and its magic Oh, it's magic. Well, I will. I have to put my slides on and I forgot one thing, Clay. We were supposed to have Bart Everwine join us tonight and he can't make it. So I did want to say a little bit about him and we'll mm -hmm. see a couple slides later on about his uh, role in this story. Um, sure. He graduated um, around the same time as Clay, 1974 in journalism, actually. He had wanted to be an English major and said Spanish was too hard. So he switched over to BS, which I think would be harder. <laughs> and uh, I think you guys crossed paths writing for the Emerald. Yes, you um, did. But he is a lover. Yeah, he's a lover of books. He reads and reads and reads. And he said he had a couple points in his life where he would have traded books for eating. So that's a high level of reading and love. He went back and got his MBA in 1988 and worked for over 30 years at um, Hoffman Construction in various roles, which um, I'll touch on when we introduce him later. So sorry he couldn't be here. So I'm going to go ahead and get my slides ready. Um, that's funny, you know, I, I, I probably traded a lot of doing a lot of Emerald stories for eating and lived up in 301 Allen Hall. <laughs> <laughs> I was a Hamilton Hall person. 
and we had um we talked about this the williams bakery right oh yeah um, my goodness you go there at two or three in the morning and they the back door they would give you uh little free samples of bread that they were baking oh i didn't get the free bread i just definitely <laughs> wanted um i felt like you got calories just by smelling it so that, that's true <laughs> ha, can everyone uh see my screen yep. with my name on it Okay, that's the boring slide. So thank you. I think uh, <laughs> we are off and running. I did it. <laughs> so um, to start us off, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you know how this how this has changed me in particular because it's it's a really unique job. So first, because it is about rowing, I had to learn how to row. So I spent uh, uh, quite a few cold mornings uh, learning to row in a single at Pocock Rowing Center. I don't know how many rowers in the audience, but it is a challenging, terrifying sport to learn, but it did give me some street cred. Um, I also did go up and fight my fears and fly in a de Havilland Beaver float plane. And that was incredible, uh, very scary, but um, I will never forget. And of course um, I went and fed um, pullers at um, their canoes at the Suquamish um, landing for a canoe journey, feeding, you know, crab and salmon to people and trying to say no to the elders. You're only supposed to give so much of something. And I was like, that seems like <laughs> I can't say no. Um, I also uh, went for fleet week here. I don't know if you've been a part of Seafair. I got to ride on a destroyer because this has strong Navy roots. I helped with um, organizing three UW classes, one in architecture, one in the arts, and another in dance, actually. This is one of the architecture classes. Um, of course, my kids have been pulled into the building for many, many hours and helping me set up for events. So here they are with the boys. And finally, you know, we all think about it. I've been at this job for three and a half years and it's really a calling. My kids even, like I said, really care about it. And I hope you guys do too. That's a great schematic of the shell house right there. <laughs> Thank you. Future <laughs> architect, right? That's right. That's right. Yes. Um, so this is how I like to start it, because I think, you know, you got to start with a question, get in the right frame of mind. So if you could think of your favorite University of Oregon landmark for a minute. What could it be? <laughs> so many. Right. Do you have any samples? Well, here are some, and I know some of them have changed over time. If you're um, a more recent grad, you'll recognize different buildings. But what we were trying to talk about in this short presentation about the history is the importance of buildings. What do you feel when you're standing inside one of these buildings or the track, the Hayward Field? You know, what does it elicit if you're just standing in front of it? And how and did it? Go, hmm? go ahead, Sorry. go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just wondering how it shaped maybe your time on campus, your memories that are attached to that building. Um, and then there's the threat of. How do you feel if it was gone? Imagine the U of O without one of these buildings or the one you're thinking of. And Clay, you know this very well about historic preservation. Well, sure. I mean, I can't imagine the U of O without Matt Court or, or any of the buildings on here. Um, I mean, we lived them. It's, it's a part of our DNA. Agreed. Well, this um, presentation, of course, about the Shell House is I'm asking people to rediscover and I iconic Pacific Northwest landmark that has been a little forgotten. So I want to have um, attention brought, thankfully, from the boys in the boat. This is their home. There has been a pilgrimage to this building, and I want you all to know about it and know that some ducks are helping it along the way, and I'd love for your help, too. Um, we have embarked on a $13 million campaign. Um, that is 10 million in construction, three for an endowment. That is to help bring this building back to life and make it a community and UW student center full of history and a waterfront venue that is inviting and um, a place that you'll never forget. Like top four, Seattle, gotta visit it. So to understand the importance of this building, we're going to talk a little bit of history. And I, I did mention I was an art history major. So I sat in a dark room with slides a lot. So for me, this is very comforting. Hopefully I make it lively. <laughs> but um, there is a lot of history to this building before and after it was the Shell House. So I wanted you all to know how important it was to our region. 
So to start, we got to start with where is it at? I'm assuming some of you might not have been to Seattle. This is a map of our, our major area. It's in the Northeast, um, one of our neighborhoods called the University District. And it is bordering the south end of, I think I have a little laser pointer here. So this is uh, the cut, it goes through Lake Union, which is where all the houseboats are. Then you have the Ballard Locks out to the sound. So it's right here on this corner. And um, that, corner of campus, if you know, right here is where the Shell House is. On the, this map, you can see all of the coastline that UW inhabits. This is the major part of campus and our medical center over here. And if you know about game day on ESPN, this is sort of the shot they like to show because they say it's the greatest setting in a college football. And I think, hey, we have this waterfront. People are sailgating right there in Husky Harbor. And look, who is in the corner? Oops, they didn't show it. It's over here, a little arrow. That is um, where the shell house is. It's always just sitting right over here. No one notices it, but they soon will. So next is going farther back in time to really understand like we started out with the land acknowledgement. This building in that area was actually underwater kind of in a marshy area and there was no way to connect these two bodies of water. So and, and it's important to know yes. that the bodies of water you're talking about is Lake Washington. Right on, over here. Yep. Uh, yeah, off to the, to the lake on the right and then Elliott Bay and Puget Sound are on the left. Yeah. And so it was a huge project to connect the two. I've heard it took like 50 years of politics, which I believe <laughs> to happen. <laughs> um, but the people of the inside, which Rafe mentioned in our acknowledgement, the Duwamish, that's the translation of the people of the inside of the Puget Sound, um, they called it carry a canoe. And in Southern Lesotho, it's called Stukwilish. And it's historically a place where indigenous people would stop, perhaps rest or eat um, before physically lifting and having to carry their canoe over to the other side. So it's also an archeological site. This, this um, engineering marvel, but could also be called very destructive, um, happened in 1917 when it completely finished. It lowered Lake Washington by nine feet. It revealed the land that the Shell House now sits on. Um, it also completely dried up the Black River, which is the south end of Lake Washington, which coincidentally is where we had had the Duwamish living. So uh, it was pretty devastating. So it comes with a lot of history that needs to be told on that as well. The, the benefits and the negatives of something like this to our, our landscape. Um, this is another orienting shot just to show you. This is campus at the University of Washington during uh, World War I. And what many people don't know, including people here in Seattle, is that this was a major training ground for um, the Navy. 15,000 servicemen um, were trained here. Um, we think possibly they were trained here because we had some aviation advances at the UW that would have attracted them. And of course our port, um, the hangar is seen here. It was built at the very end, but I wanted you all to know that among the population included Oregon's Naval Militia. They were recruited from Coos Bay, Astoria and Portland aiding in their effort. Uh, this is a sign that you can find on campus that proves that it was a naval ground. And this is the actual um, notice in the paper. So I'm proving that we are connected again. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. I'm proving, I don't know why. But this is uh, the actual shot of Portage Bay there. This doesn't yet have the hangar. So this is the side um, where Portage Bay is just to the left getting into detail here, but here are the blueprints actually for the building. It's 10,000 square feet. It was built to house seaplanes. You know, it wasn't built as a boathouse. Um, it could hold um, quite a few inside. And we have, um, let's see, we think it was built in about three months time, which is pretty quick. It actually said it was built to be moved if needed, which I would like to see how that would happen. But the big point here is that it's one of only two remaining wooden hangars from World War I, right here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the other one did not house seaplanes. So this is a really um, important building for the military history of our country too. This is a picture which I love to see. And um, the next two images just show that seaplanes inside the building. Um, it was a training ground for aviators. Uh, you'll notice that the plane's wings on this one are clipped. They should be longer. They were called penguins 
This is a Burgess U2 for my aviation people I know are listening. Um, it was teaching aviators how to fly so that they couldn't really take a lift off. They kind of, so they were learning. I could handle that maybe. <laughs> This next one I love. So this is the shot if your back was to the doors of the hangar, the water's behind you and you're looking inside. So you can see, uh, I love this, you can see the photographer down here. If you were looking close, I like that. But here you also see this big metal steel beam. Um, this was a trolley built to hold and hoist up to two tons of the planes up and out of the way if they needed to. That beam is still there though um, cut off when we made the Pocock shop, which I'll show you. In the mm -hmm. foreground, yeah, is the picture of the Burgess U2 and then the Curtis HS1 is in this far back corner. That is just a huge, huge, uh, awe-inspiring, almost overwhelming experience to be inside. You're, you're tiny inside this huge house, <laughs> this huge I, hangar. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you can see the guys down here. Yeah. They, it's pretty, they look small because it is big, it's cavernous. Um, so I'm jumping over now during the war effort. If you remember in the book, um, George Pocock kind of had a funny little lie that got him to come to the University of Washington about building shells. And he started to do that. And then the war happened and he ended up working for Boeing, um, building the pontoons here for the Boeing Model C. Um, so these pontoons are, are oops, sorry. They're, they were lightweight, strong, and were able to withstand landing on water, which is very similar, obviously, to building shells, which need to be lightweight, fast, and endure all the water and the weight of the men inside. So he transferred his skills beautifully, and he worked at Boeing for um, a couple of years after the war. So in the book, you might also remember Hiram Conabare. He's one of our first coaches at the UW. Um, he was highlighted because he was sort of the beginning of rowing. Um, and these two are boat houses that the UW used for just a little while because after the Alaska Yukon Exposition, our first World's Fair in 1909, these were left over. And so the crew used them, but they weren't ideal. So um, people may not know, why should I care about UW rowing? We're ducks, what's going on here? But you have to know that in the Pacific Northwest, this is the premier team and it has been, um, you know, since it started in 1903. So I, I think we can all feel safe in cheering for them, both men and women, because they do represent us and sort of our grit and our continued excellence in this sport. Here is the shell house at the very beginning. So after the Navy moved out, the war had ended, um, our coach at the time, Coach Ed Leader said, can we have that building? And they moved right in. It looks pretty desolate here, still kind of looks like a hangar, but they painted on the front of it, ASUW, which means Associated Students of the University of Washington, because our student government technically sort of ran our sports programs, managed the budget, the coaches. So they wanted their name on it. And now that's why we, we honor it too. Um, and I wanted to click through here quickly these are all the national championships that the men's team won from this building, including the purple ones, which are gold medals, as you know, the 36 team that we're talking about tonight. But this one, 1923, the first time the, a team from the West Coast has ever won the national championship. That was a big year. And then of course, all these other years, there would be more, but there were some world wars happening. So it's an incredible building for national rowing history. Okay, now we're jumping ahead. So we finally lured George Pocock away from Boeing. I don't know how, but we said, hey, we'll build this workshop in the back. So this is that same view we saw when it was a hangar, but we've now put a workshop back there. And over here we have showers and a bunch of oars and racks of boats. And this is the scene that this boys would have felt and seen when they walked in the first time. There would have been an entry over here and like uh, Clay said, the building sort of just overwhelms you. Um, and at that time, it wouldn't have been empty. It would have been full of the sounds of, you know, guys talking, showers going, no heat, <laughs> the smell of cedar, and up here, probably the hum of machinery, because it was all happening right here. So a really exciting place, but full of awe. So again, one of our main characters and a real person, George Pocock, um, lucky to have him in the sport and upstairs making the fastest racing, racing shells in the world. Here he's holding a single 
Um, his words, as you know, notice in the book, begin each chapter. Um, he was quite um, an advice giver and he was really reflective um, and really important to helping with the strategy of the boys and also the art of making the fastest shells. Can you imagine being a competitor going, hey, well, he made them for you. Oh, I, don't, I don't want a shell from him. That was the only choice and they were the fastest. So this is a picture of how crowded it was in that space. So when Joe Rance was going up those stairs, which would have ended right about here, he would have been talking to George in this space full of the smell, like I said, of that cedar, but also varnish. Um, hopefully this is a radiator because it would have been cold. <laughs> um, this was a place where, you know, it was an intimate space where he could have really had a great conversation with George. George could look out over the interior here and hear and watch the sounds of the boys. Um, really unique thing to have the boat builder on site. And if you come to the shell house, this is where the magic really happens. This next picture shows Coach Ulbrichsen, which is another main character. Um, here he is with a bunch of boys trying to, you know, probably sort out who's in what boat that day. Terrifying for everyone. It looks cold, there's water all over. This is the scene that they would have felt um, every morning, very early. Next, this is one of my favorite images. It shows um, just how big of an interest the media had, the community had in, um, you know, celebrating the boys. Here they are kind of launching off and they, with the Montlake cut, they can go this way towards um, Lake Union or they can go this way all the way out to Lake Washington. It was a really smart spot to have a rowing a boathouse. Another favorite picture, and I know Clay likes this one too. Here's the shell house back here. We're looking the other direction towards Portage Bay. We used to have stadium style seating. This is a 1936 and the Montlake Bridge right here. Um, it was like football is now. Everything stopped. There were trains following the races. It was on the radio. It was a big deal. Um, this highlights that. That's no longer there, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we're looking east in this photo. Yeah, and right now it looks like, you know, overgrown bushes and trees, but there is the Montlake cut that's always kind of um, a symbol of the raceway, but all the bleachers are gone. So now we're to our favorite team, right? We love this image. We've got Joe right here, um, Don Hume right here. I mean, this is the iconic image, but what you probably didn't notice until now because I'm making you learn all the history is they're standing right there on the docks or the ramp down to the water. And there's the shell house right behind them. And you can stand there too. And that's so important to know that where you're standing is where someone um, in history also stood. It's just incredible. And Clay, you found this article. So maybe uh, you could chat well, about- Yeah, this is just um, you know confirmation that this was the Northwest's team. Um, it was big news and we'll hear more about it. And you, you saw them in the film clip when the 1936 Olympics uh, in rowing, this was the American team and the Register Guard used to be, when I was in school and many of you as well, used to be an afternoon paper. And so this is the very day of the win. And from that side of the world, this iconic photo was printed on the front page of the Guard. Uh, signifying how important this was to the entire Northwest. Very cool. So um, this is uh, the canoe house. So it turned into a different facility after 1950 when the crew moved out. And that's sort of what was known by for the, for the rest of its life until I came on board. There's a great plaque that's now outside of it, thanks to Daniel James Brown and our alumni association at UW. And proof that it is on the National Register in 1975, the community put it there. It's a big deal and it's one of only two buildings on our campus with that um, registration. This is how it looked when I took on the building uh, project. And, you know, it was full of privately owned um, shells, kayaks and canoes, a sweet spot to rent for pretty low price. Um, but we were ready to take it to the next level and open it up to the wider community with a bigger purpose. So um, to get to the future part, which is why now, how, why you know, take this time to turn over a building to this new purpose? 
And there's just a lot of different catalysts, but the biggest one <laughs> is this book. This book has changed everything. Uh, it is a gift. It is a gift that it was written um, and the story was kind of dying with the generation that was starting to fall away. And if Judy Rance hadn't followed her dad around and got that story, um, we wouldn't all have it. So um, as a campus community, this is such, um, I don't know, beyond what you could expect for value setting about what's important for us. Um, so the book has sold 3.2 million copies is the latest I've heard. It's been translated into 19 languages. It's incredible. So it's still going. I think, is it considered a modern day classic? I don't know when that happens, but. Oh, let's, let's just call it that. I mean, it's, <laughs> okay. it's, it's, uh, it's narrative nonfiction at its best and telling a story with the sensory detail that, that sends the hairs up the back of your neck. It's, a, it's, it's the kind of thing that anybody anywhere in the world can identify with. And yet it's right here in the Pacific Northwest. This happened here. This isn't anything remote. Oh, it gives us a lot of pride. Um, another tipping point for us is we have tours. And so I want to mention Melanie Barstow founded these, a former rower. She's now graduated, but she calls them the boys of 1936 tours. She's led over 170 tour groups. And as you see here on TripAdvisor, she's number two out of what says 257 different kind of tours you can take to Seattle. Number two, this is one woman. She's led over 4,000 people. So there is interest. We call it the pilgrimage and you should come to when COVID lifts, <laughs> okay? Um, the other you know, point here is that our team is still remains excellent. Our men's and women's teams we have, um, besides the championships I mentioned in the old Shell House, the women have 17 conference champs, championships and 12 national. The men have a total of 19 national championships. It's incredible. So they kind of rule, if I get to say. Um, and then there's the movie factor. We love a Clooney factor. You know, there, Dan, Daniel can explain this up and down with the movie drama, but right now we believe it's in the hands of George Clooney, MGM and Warner Brothers. And once COVID lifts, this will be filmed. And we just, oh, this story on the big screen, they better get it right. It's, it's just such a powerful story. Well, they've got the right person to do it. I mean, given his track record and his interest in this, you can find it all over the web. We're really looking forward to it. Um, and then there's, you know, but what will it become? And that was the biggest task with the, the first thing I had to do. And who will it serve? How will it be self-sustaining? Which was another piece of uh, the puzzle. I think I always go back to the boys. You know, this building is about resilience, hard work, importance of community as kind of the guiding forces of what the building should do. Um, we want to make sure that the history is front and center. The building itself is an artifact and there's paint splotches on the floor, there's things written on the wall. Those are part of the patina of what matters in this building. We don't want those memories and those stories to be forgotten. So now we go into the what we hope it to be. This is a rendering done by SHKS Architects. It shows it at a graduation, of course, but we want this buzzing with activity. We want it to be the place where all UW students find themselves at one point in their Husky experience. So it's hard to hear about Huskies, but the community also will be coming to this building. You know, we will have um, gatherings and lectures and events and, you know, even concerts we'll have up here in the loft, we'll have um, a mezzanine com completely dedicated to exhibits. And then of course, the heart of the building George Pocock's loft. We want to turn it right back into what it was. We actually have all the original, they call them jigs and uh, machinery that George Pocock himself used. They're up in Fort Townsend with this gentleman, Steve Chapin, who still makes Pocock wooden singles. No one buys the eights anymore, <laughs> but he makes them. So he'll be activating that workshop, which I think will be just bringing the heart back to this building, the smells, the hum, all the things. So for those in the audience that are architects, this is a mixed use program, which I'm learning all those things, but it will basically be a flexible space that can do all the things that we needed to do to um, create revenue through events, but also be welcoming to our students on a daily basis. You know, the Shell House, I want it to be this must-see attraction. I already have been getting lots of wedding requests, even in the state it's in now. So, I mean, it you have to see it. It is just gonna be amazing when it's lit up. 
I love this watercolor. It shows it sort of as a beacon on the water, inviting the community in um, a real hub for our, like I said, 2.1 miles of waterfront. When this starts, you know, everything else falls into place. I took this picture the other day. Um, I just want you to know that the history in this place is palpable. When you walk in, you feel it. Even though it's cold, you feel that too. Um, but the building has a soul. And it's, it's something that's so special and rare. It gives me like jitters just thinking about it. So I can't wait for you all to come see it. Some of you might have been at the U of O tailgate um, last 2019. It is a must see. Finally, um, in order to restore the Shell House um, and make it a place where we can all share its history, um, I need your help as fellow members of the Pacific Northwest to help spread the word, possibly support it if you can. But the boys in the boat, is a story about, yes, the greatest generation, about the values that get you through the hard times, about a community that backs one another, um, and about a spirit that ignites us all who live in this beautiful area that we call home. Thank you for letting me share my, my story and my love for this building as a deck and as a Husky staffer. <laughs> um, can, yeah. you, can you tell us about um, the special interest of another uh, grad from my class, uh, Bart Everwine? Oh yeah, you're so right. We could almost do this professionally, Clay. Let's see, <laughs> so uh, yes, Bart. So he couldn't be here, but he's become a true friend just like Clay. Um, I met him, you know, kind of randomly. I, I saw an ad in a PJ Sound Business Journal that Hoffman Construction cares about the community. It was a big full page ad. So feeling kind of excited that day, I gave, <laughs> I gave that number a call. I figured it out, left a message with apparently Bart. He called me right back because he heard the words boys in the boat and he is a super fan you know he had been part of uh, the literary arts um, in portland sat on that board he's been committed to that um, literary tourism for a long time and with his co contractor businessman hat on he's like let's come tour so he brought his team they all fell in love with the building They're like how can we help in this kind of you know formation way um, time we were in. So um, he decided, like, here's a picture. He is, I said, standing over a great big hole. But yes, he is super experienced, like 30 years. So he, having his time was a big deal. And when he said this project is something they want to help with, um, it was great. He, he and his team put together um, an estimate for all the costs, a pro bono, um, which would have been like this uh, quote says probably a six figure real time um, commitment of effort and energy. This funny looking picture is actually a 3D scan of the building that they did and we got to utilize actually a UW arch architecture class that came and watched it happen. And that will help us with all future, you know, changes to the building. It was just a huge gift. He's remained um, a board supporter and um, really helped push this project forward. I think he would want me to say that he doesn't want to see this building uh, be ignored any longer. He definitely has a, a passion for maintenance and us taking care of our assets. So um, thank you, Bart. Um, I hope you watch this and are proud. Um, you're such a huge help in this and early on too. Thank you. He's, he's You can feel it with him. And before we, I, I'm going to talk just a hair here. But I want to make sure to let, let you all know that there have been a lot of great questions that have come in, some of them for us, and some of them are, are just anticipating Daniel uh, uh, just around the bend. But a couple of quick questions, and Nicole, you can help me with this. Uh, one question is, is the actual 1936 footage that we saw at the beginning, is it available publicly? And I can answer that. That's just go to YouTube. It's uh, in various forms, and it was a PBS documentary as well. Um, but another question that, Nicole, you could take on, and, and um, just quickly, could you tell what the vision is for the inside of the building? Um, will, it, will, it, will the building still essentially be the same or uh, with only some internal modifications? And uh, what can and can't you do, given yeah. that it's a landmark? Yeah, I forgot to also mention the more restrictive one is that we are now a Seattle landmark. Yes. So um, restrictive in a good way. Um, right. So yeah, the interior, we really want to keep it as open as possible. That main hangar space that makes you feel that impression of 
you know, how big it is, those old Douglas fir timbers, they need to stay. So structurally, there might have to be moment bracing. I'm learning these words that will help with like steel metal beams that will help the building take on these next hundred years. Um, if we do have the Pocock loft, that means we'll need um, an elevator up there for ADA. So we'll have to improve the internal structure there. But basically, underneath um, that area or the area that was the locker room, we have to decide what to do with that, but we're not breaking up the space in any way. The hangar doors will work again. Um, just modern upgrades like heat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we're gonna move on here. Um, the, the way I got involved is um, a local restaurateur, Bob Donegan. Uh, some of you may know the Ivers chain. He got a hold of me and my column partner for the Seattle Times and said, you have to meet this Nicole Klein. She is the most ebullient person you'd ever want to meet. And we write a column in the Seattle Times. And Nicole, you could go to the next slide. It's called Now and Then, which takes an old photo and then takes a modern photo from the same vantage point. So here we have that classic photo of the 1936 team. And what we did is we, with Nicole's help, we gathered all of the descendants of these guys that we could at one time and group them by family to pose in the same order as they posed in the 1936 shot. So they are all in this photo. And then you'll see in the next slide how it turned out as a column in the paper. It's usually a one pager where you compare the old and the new and write some text to describe it. And it's just another example of how this is really a wide appeal to people all over the Northwest. And I was, I was particularly excited to do this column because of that recognition and the fact that it's an ongoing campaign. This isn't just some history lesson or old stuff. This is something that's gonna live on into the future. I mean, there's, it's no accident uh, that, the, that the campaign slogan is the next 100 years. And, at this point, um, we're going to welcome Daniel James Brown. Um, and I, this is a real honor for me to introduce him and make sure this is your chance, if you're following this closely, to um, enter into the, uh, into the, the chat, into the Q&A, the questions you might have for Daniel, because this is your chance to have a conversation with him. We'll moderate the questions and get as many to him as possible. But Daniel, he, he lives here in the Seattle area as well. He grew up in San Francisco Bay Area, and he, and he att attended Diablo Bay, uh, Di excuse me, Di Diablo Valley College, uh, UC Berkeley, UCLA. He taught writing at San Jose State University and at Stanford before he became a technical writer here with, with Microsoft for a period of time and an editor there. Is, and, and now his specialty is what you got to read in the book. It's narrative nonfiction. He does this full time. And he says that his primary interest is bringing compelling history to life in the present moment as vividly and accurately as possible. And he's written a number of books but he's not just a writer. I mean, when he's not writing, I mean, he's got a family, his wife and two daughters, and he's got cats and dogs and chickens and honeybees. And when he's not writing, he's got ways to, uh, to refresh by going out birding and gardening and fly fishing, even reading American history and, and, and uh, chasing a bear or two away from his beehives. So Daniel, it's great. To, uh, to, to have, welcome you here. And um, there are a number of questions um, that we could start with, but I'm gonna start with one that's asked by one of the participants here, James Chang. And he has one directly for you, Daniel, and you probably um, resonate with this given your many public presentations. He's saying, after the boys won the Olympic gold medal, did they immediately understand what they had accomplished on the big world stage? Or did the reality sink in only later as they grew older and, and as World War II began? And, and, and so you could start off by uh, just getting us into their lives and their heads back in 1936. Yeah, that, you know, that's a great question. Um, I, 
don't think I've ever heard it phrased quite that way or thought about it a great deal, but I would say that uh, in some, they did not really realize the import of what they had done uh, in the moment. You know, when after the games, some of them went on a tour, a bike tour around um, Europe. Some of them uh, came immediately home. All of them were home basically in the fall in time to get back to school and try to get a job to get through college for another year. So they were really focused on just moving on with their lives, getting that college degree if they could, earning some kind of a living while they were doing it and continuing to row. Actually, pretty much the entire crew wound up rowing together in 1937 and again, were undefeated that year. So rowing remained an important part of their lives. But they really, I don't think, I don't think they really understood what they had pulled off um, until some years later when uh, Seattle began to really seriously pay attention. Um, some of them you know, came home and put their gold medals in their socks or sock drawers rather, closed the drawers, didn't even tell their kids they had been in the Olympics, let alone that there was a gold medal uh, in the sock drawer. So they were, they were such a humble bunch of guys. Uh, they didn't talk about it much. And um, I think by the time they were old men, they got it. Um, by then they, they had quite a bit of attention had been steered their way. Um, largely because Bobby Mock, their coxswain, spent the rest of his life um, advocating for them and trying to make sure that their story was told. But it, it took a long time. That is that is terrific. And, you know, you're talking about as we get closer to the present, it's more, much more appreciated. Um, Nicole made reference to the George Clooney movie that's pending. And um, Kathy Soriano, a great friend of mine, um, asked about the film and Katie Kuski also is asking, um, Daniel, were you able or are you going to be able to work with the script writers for the movie? And, and even if you aren't, um, it would be fascinating to know what your thoughts are about what should the movie look like? And maybe even some some casting ideas. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with me casting it is the only movie stars I know are from like 1968. So it would have <laughs> Dustin Hoffman in it. Um, I don't know the current company. <laughs> I do not know the current crop of actors, but I will tell you. Um, so I'm pretty optimistic. Uh, the film thing has been up and down for years. It's been booted all over Hollywood, um, but it is now in the hands of MGM and George Clooney uh, and his production company. And um, Clooney called me, uh, I guess it's probably about four or five months ago now. And uh, we sat down we had a long um, detailed conversation about um, how he saw the story and listened to how I saw the story. And they were really remarkably similar. So I was first of all very impressed that he had not just read the book but he really had dissected, he really, he really dove into it. And he saw the things that were really, I think most important to bring forward. Now I've not seen the script. They have had a script writer working on it for ever since, for the last six months or so. And I've not seen that script. So I can't really, you know, I can't comment on it. I don't have any contractual right to, um, to review that script or get involved with it. Um, Clooney actually did say he would be running it by me at some point. Um, so that's very fortunate for, for the author of a book to have that privilege. Um, I'm just going to follow up real quickly, and okay. and, um, and and this will relate to how you approached the book itself. Um, but some people on the surface might assume, oh, this is just a sports movie. But no, I don't think so. Tell us, tell, and the same applies to the book. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit for us? Sure, yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely not just a sports story. It's st uh, the sport of rowing, which turns out to be pretty interesting. I didn't actually know it would turn out to be interesting when I started this. But the sport is just the stage on which this sort of human drama plays out. And it's really a drama of these disadvantaged young men growing up in the Northwest during the depression and the, the things they had to struggle through 
you know, just in terms of, of staying alive and feeding, uh, feeding their families and making a living and trying to get through school, um, all those sort of things that everybody in that generation went through. And then the interpersonal dramas that went on as they competed with other uh, young men from Washington State to get into that boat. And then of course, this sort of um, rather dramatic uh, difference between uh, the world they came from and the world that East Coast rowers tended to come from, which were, was a much more elite kind of background, generally speaking. So there were, there were so many different dramatic tensions going on in that story that um, that's why it appealed to me so much as I began to understand it. But that's why I think it really uh, winds up rising above, um, you know, just not that I have anything, I actually a big fan of good sports writing. For sure. But, but I think that, uh, I think this is a story that, that rises above, uh, above sport. Well, what it is, it's the ultimate human interest story. I mean, anybody can relate to these guys uh, as you take them through the story. And I presume that'll be Clooney's approach of it with the movie as well. Um, you know, a good journalist like you uh, puts in a lot of foot leather, you know, going and doing all of the homework and the interviewing. Um, but um, Amira Mansour is asking about this form of foot leather. Uh, with the question of, did you, when you were doing the research and writing for the book, did you take up rowing yourself? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. Um, I'm too uh, too short and too fat to, to be, uh, too, too short to be a rower and too fat to be a coxswain. Um, so I would not do well in a boat. The only time, I've, I've been in a boat a few times. Um, I, did, mm -hmm. I did the freshman coach um, at Washington took me out in the launch and uh, we went up and down the lake one very, very cold January day following the freshman crew and I spent the day with them. And, and that was a really interesting experience. I, that was the first real insight I got into how just brutally tough uh, the sport is, particularly if you are, are rowing here in the Northwest in the middle of the winter um, and the incredible level of fitness that it requires. I mean, it was, that was really eye-opening to me. And, you, can, and, you can tell that from the film. My God, the, the intensity, the mental and physical intensity. Um, we've got Bill Pringer on this, uh, on this Zoom. Uh, he's, he's close to my era. He graduated in 68 from the UVO. And he lived in Seattle in the 70s and so knows the area pretty well. And, and he wants to know, and, and you could go on with this for an hour, but give us... Give us an example, like a, one of your best stories about the personal lives of the boys as they grew up and the hardships and their relationships with their parents. I mean, you could draw from a lot, but just pick one as a great example. You know, I just, I have to come back to Joe Rance, who's the principal character in the book. Um, you know, Joe was, um, because his stepmother uh, did not much like him, um, and because she had her own natural children that she was trying to raise. Um, she was really incredibly cruel uh, to Joe and his father did not really stand up for him. And so Joe was basically thrown out of the family when he was an adolescent and left to live alone in this half built house uh, out on the Olympic Peninsula. And that caused Joe, um, I mean, it affected everything about his life. From a very early age, he began to believe that he could only depend on himself, uh, that the world was hostile and threatening, that he had to be able to do everything on his own. And it made him incredibly tough, incredibly resilient, um, and it served him well um, up to the point where he tried to become a part of a crew. And at that point, it actually, some of those virtues began to become a problem for him because because he believed he needed to do everything himself, he tried to row the boat across the line by himself, basically. He didn't really understand the nature of crew, the, the essential nature of crew, which is that you are trying to fit into a well-oiled machine. You're trying to fit in both physically, but also psychologically 
with the other eight people who are in the boat and become part of this one thing that's bigger than, than any of them individually. So that was a real struggle from, for Joe to sort of transcend himself and begin to understand that you know, he, had to, he had to row as much for the guy in front of him and the guy behind him as for himself. And it was Pocock, George Pocock, the boat builder, really that um, began to sort of um, teach him that as Joe would go up into the loft and talk to Pocock. Pocock empathized with him for a number of reasons. Pocock had lost um, his mother uh, when he was young. So Pocock sort of took him under, under his wing and began to give him very sage advice that, that helped him a lot. You know, as, as I listen to you describe this, um, it's, it's, it's clear that, that you have, have gotten into the level of detail to be able to, to tell a narrative story, even though there may have been holes in the research, and, and that's natural for anybody who's doing a nonfiction book. Um, we've got Kyle Harris here on the, on the Zoom, who is, I, I think, uh, marveling at what you have done, and, and he's wondering I mean, he, he thinks it would be incredibly difficult to write narrative nonfiction. And he wants to know, is there an, a harder form of popular literature to take on than that? <laughs> and, and, and I would ask you, if that's true, if there's some truth to that, why, why are you so drawn to it? Well, I'm drawn to it because it's something I've always liked reading. I mean, I, for years before I decided to take this up, that was what primarily what I read. Well, when I was younger, I read a lot of fiction, a lot of literature. But um, from my middle age on, I began to read a lot of narrative nonfiction, and I just I liked I liked learning about history in the form of a story, which is what the genre is. So I was drawn to it um, uh, from my own exposure to it. It is hard. Um, it's hard primarily in that it requires a vast, as you mentioned, Clay, it, it involves massive amounts of research to do it well. Because I believe that um, I, want to, I want to take my reader up and put them down in a scene or in the sky. I want to put them in the boat um, so that they see and hear and smell and know everything that's going on. That requires a lot of research. You have to learn about rowing. You have to learn about the society in which these boys are growing up. You have to gather the weather for that particular day in 1935 and so on and so forth. So it's extremely labor intensive in terms of the research. Um, I personally don't find the actual writing to be very hard because by the time I've done all that research, I've got so much stuff in my head, it's just trying to get out. So it doesn't always come out real elegantly, um, but that's okay. Uh, one of the things I've learned as a writer over the years is is to get it out of my head and onto paper, put it in a drawer, and then come back to it a week or two weeks later. And I can always see, you know, massive amounts of stuff that I could do better if I put it aside for a while and come back. Isn't that funny it. how that works? I mean, just just having a, having a, even a day or two, you know, you yeah. come back and you have fresh eyes. It's, it's pretty amazing. It makes all the difference in the world. I mean, I wish I'd known this when I was a student <laughs> and hammering papers out, you know, 1 a.m. to turn, yeah. turn in at 7 a.m. If I'd given myself a day, it would have come out better. <laughs> hey, Clay? Yeah. Could I interrupt real se second? I know, so that research you did, Dan, um, I know a fact that you never went inside the shell house before that. So for your research purposes, how did you create that environment? Well, you may remember that actually uh, Judy and I snuck into this oh. um, We w When I first was- um, So he's the I, one, Nicole. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Judy, Joe Ramsey's daughter Judy um, was the one that brought the story to me and asked me ultimately to write the book. And one of the things I realized early on was I want, I didn't know what that building was all about. And I knew Pocock's shop had been in there and I really wanted to see the inside. So we went down and it was locked up and I didn't know anybody at the university. So we finally found a back door, just slightly ajar. And um, we, we crept in there and crept around and I took a few hurried pictures and then somebody caught us and shoot us out of, out of the building. So um, 
I'm sorry, I digressed from your question, uh, but that but that was my first exposure to, to the to the building. So Daniel, um, I've got a sports related question from uh, Nick Vajovich, and he's asking, what's the importance of the rivalry that this team had with Cal uh, on raising their level of achievement? And you might be able to speak to this particularly given your California college experience. Yeah, so I went to, uh, to Washington's rival. I went to Cal Berkeley, um, which is something I didn't tell anybody at the Washington <laughs> shoutouts until after the book was published. Um, and it, grew, <laughs> it caused quite a stir when I mentioned it. The rivalry in the 1930s was very intense. Um, I know I knew very little about rowing growing up. I went to Cal, but I wasn't paying any attention to rowing or sports in general, actually. Um, but I did remember that my dad, who also went to Cal uh, in the 1930s, was always talking about what a great rowing team uh, Berkeley had. Um, and he talked about this guy named Kai E. Bright, and I just sort of, I didn't pay much attention. But, um, so it wasn't really until I started researching the book that I realized how very intense that rivalry was and how much, how much it drove forward actually both programs. I mean, both programs produced Olympic gold uh, teams. And um, Kai E. Bright was a really interesting character, kind of difficult guy, but, um, but really interesting character to write about. And, um, and so the tension between those, those, those two schools, um, while it was very intense, I think, as I say, I think it made West Coast rowing, um, it really helped put West Coast rowing on a par with East Coast rowing and ultimately surpassing East Coast rowing uh, during those years. You know, um, the, the questions keep coming in and they're great. We're not going to be able to get to them all, but, but I've got a provocative one here. John Peterson is saying rowers tend to be academic and career overachievers. And I guess I want to know, do you agree with that and, and why? Actually, I do agree with it. And just based on my observation, um, you know, I spent uh, four years after the book was published, I was almost continuously on the road giving talks to various organizations about the boys in the boat. And um, many of those were hosted by um, very successful people in a wide variety of fields, neuros uh, neurosurgeons and um, attorneys and um, various kinds of corporate uh, entities. And the thing I found over and over again was that um, these men, and it was mostly men um, because of the times and from which they came. Um, most of them had, um, had been rowers in college and attributed the discipline, not just the discipline actually, the discipline of rowing plus the learning how to work with other people, um, learning how to pull together towards a common goal um, to be a, a very obvious thing that so many of them rightly or wrongly, I can't speak to that, but they attributed their success to their, to their rowing careers back in the 30s and 40s and, and 50s. And the early mornings, the dedication. Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah. You gotta be, a, you gotta be a, a, an early bird. Um, we've got a few more minutes and, and several other questions, but I don't wanna let this opportunity go by with, without asking my favorite question, which is um, the, just, the brilliant title of the book. I mean, <laughs> Boys in the Boat. It's alliterative, it's got rhythm, it's just got magic to it. And, and particularly the writers among us would like to know, you know, how was that title arrived at with your publisher? So uh, it uh, turns out I'm very bad at titles. Um, and this, there's a long pattern of me being very bad at titles and being overridden by um, editors and other people. In this case, um, I had proposed a series of titles for this book, all of which were kind of flowery and metaphorical and- um, Well, what's an example? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm sure, I'm not sure I can pull one up at the moment, but they were overwrought and obscure. Um, and um, my agent got so mad at me. I remember on the phone, her sort of spluttering out one day, uh, no, 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 just, just, you know, what it is, the boys in the, boys in the boat. And 
and at first I thought she was crazy. I thought, boy, it's just so dull. It's so dead. I, I didn't get it at first, but I, you know, within an hour or two of that conversation, I started thinking about it. I wrote it down on a piece of paper and looked at it. And I started to realize it actually was, a, as you say, Clay, I think it was a good title. It's sort of punchy, it's alliterative. It does describe what's in the book, which is the thing they are always preaching at me to do. Um, and um, I think part of the reason it works is actually the word boys. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the 19, 40s, 50s. I remember my dad always talking about the boys. He was going to go out and play poker with the boys or he's going to go to a ball game with the boys or whatever. It's a term that during those years men used as a kind of bonding uh, term. And it, it didn't mean little boy in any sense. It just meant my fellows, my boys. And I think in addition to the alliteration, I think that resonates with a lot of people, particularly older people, um, sure. who remember that. They all they all were boys, you know. And, and then they all were boys. They'd all and and you know, particularly my older re readers remember that time. So I think it worked. I think it worked worked out really well. Well, I think we've got time for one more question, maybe another, depending on how long you answer this one. But, but uh, I, I think a. a a, a, a good wrap up to, for this whole thing is the, the fact that you have you have a unique perspective here. I mean, you've shared it with everybody through your book, but there's nobody who knows what you know, uh, including what didn't go into the book. And and so, from your unique perspective, what is your vision? for what the Shell House should be once it's fully funded and reopened. What does that look like to you? Yeah, I mean, the reason I got involved with the Shell House project is basically, you know, the boys are all, the boys have grown old and died, passed away. The Shell House has grown old, but the Shell House can be reborn. And um, in, in many ways, it's the last, the last witness to that story, the last, as, as uh, Nicole said, it's got a soul. And I think that it needs to be brought back to life. And so I see it, I mean, it can be, I'm, I, the plan is to use it for a variety of purposes, you know, gatherings and, and uh, this for the advantage uh, of students at UW and for the community, the larger Seattle community, and in fact, the Northwest community. Um, because it, that building sort of encapsulates so many Northwest values, I think. Um, but for me, the thing I'm most excited about is that loft up in the back and George Pocock's legacy. I am really hoping that um, if possible, Steve Chapin uh, can get the shop up and running up in there. So again, that all of wooden boats are being built up there um, and or we can use it as a sort of shrine slash museum space to Pocock and his legacy, because he was so much a part of this story. He, um, his spirit sort of hangs over the, the, the building, hangs over the story. And so I'm really, um, I'm excited about that particular com uh, component, especially. Well, Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, this has been an incredible question and answer session. And there are more questions that have been asked. I, I hate to put you on the spot, but if we got you the questions after the fact, would you be able to uh, answer them and get them back to this group uh, through the U of O Alumni Association? Yeah, I mean, a reasonable number of them, I certainly can. Um, okay. I'm uh, engaged in getting another book out into the world. So uh, <laughs> I, I got to put that first, but yes, I, I certainly take a stab at that. Well, great. And so now it's my my job right now to turn the floor back over to Rafe. And Rafe, would you please close this event for us? This has been incredible. I'm so glad we had the time with you, Daniel. And Nicole, um, your excitement is palpable as well. And thank you. It's been an honor to be a part of this. Rafe? Well, Clay, thank you. I'll, I'll close by thanking both you and Nicole for making this event possible, for taking us behind the scenes of the boys in the boat and the shell house. And uh, you know, we are, we are both lucky and proud to claim both of you as ducks. And a special thanks uh, to author Daniel James Brown for sharing this story with the world and, and for being so generous with his time tonight. We really appreciate it. 
Uh, to our folks attending, if you're inspired to learn more about the Shell House or to help in the restoration efforts, as Daniel says, to bring it back to life, or even to visit, please contact Nicole Klein using the information on the screen. And we'll also include that information in a follow-up email to attendees to make it a little easier for you to get that. That follow-up message will also include a brief survey and we'd appreciate your feedback to help the UOAA continue to offer programming you enjoy. We hope to see you at another event soon. Go Ducks and good night. <laughs>